So I think everyone's here. Um, I guess we could get started. I, I could quickly introduce um, all of the all the speakers here, and then I'll let them take it away. But um, so I, I'm Daniel. I I work at F2 Pool, a proof of work mining pool, and we've been um, putting together this working group called the Blockchain Infrastructure Carbon Offset Working Group, um, and have gathered basically all the who's who of like the climate crypto space here. Um, and then we've been doing uh, work on measurements, offset types, um, offset incentivizations. We've been hosting a, a lot of these Twitter spaces, um, IRL, IRL events, um, figuring out carbon credit incentivization. Um, we've been kind of closely watching and um, seeing how Klima has been doing a lot of the, this great um, first part of what we call sort of these green Lego blocks in, in crypto. Um, and basically up here we have on stage is a lot of the who's who of who have been doing, putting a lot of this groundwork in for um, interfacing climate issues with, with crypto. So um, I think we can just go, go around and uh, quickly introduce ourselves. Maybe I think, Joseph, you can start, Gregory, then Sarah, then Rafa. Can't hear Joseph. <clears throat> Gregory, you want to take it away then? Uh, sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Gregory. I'm a co-founder of Region Network. Um, we are a, a public blockchain built with the Cosmos SDK that is dedicated to um, creating a, a public, transparent um, public ledger for ecological claims. And so we tokenize sort of natively tokenized, have a, a native on-chain registry system for ecological assets. We also partnered with Klima and Toucan to, to bring some of the, about 10% of the, the carbon over um, the Toucan bridge into the Klima um, treasury and larger liquidity pools. And so we were sort of engaged in that. And um, and Sarah Baxendale, who's one of the speakers, is our um Biz, uh, director of business development, she really led a lot of that. And um, also, we've yeah, just been kind of collaborating with everybody in the space for quite a while. Excited to be here, excited to unpack, you know, um, carbon credit quality, what that might mean, why it's important. And um, yeah, that's, that's me. Um, maybe since I mentioned Sarah, I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is my first time on Twitter, literally. I made a handle for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> true story. Um, so my name is Sarah Baxendale. I work as part of the Regen team. I was a part of our um, internal process where we chose credits that became BCTs, um, some of which um, contributed to the Klima Treasury itself and some of which contributed to other individuals in the ecosystem um, joining the Klima launch. So... You know, we were interested in having this conversation to sort of unpack what's in a BCT, you know, what types of credits are now in there, how do different people approach the creation of BCT, what did people bring into that marketplace, um, and what does it tell us about some of our assumptions about the market at large and um, where we would all like to see it evolve. So excited to be here um, and excited uh, to hear what everyone has to say today. So thanks for having us. And maybe I'll, I'll pass to Raphael um, so that Joseph has some time to get his uh, words working again. Hi, folks. On the off chance that Raphael's system is doing similar to what I was, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Shall I just go ahead? Yep. Great. Um, Thank you. So uh, my name is Joseph Pallant, and I'm um, a longtime participant in the carbon market space and a reasonably long time in the the, the intersection with um, crypto and blockchain as well. Um, so I wear a number of hats. I'm the director of climate innovation at Ecotrust Canada, a Canadian charity building economies that provide for life um, and do a lot of my carbon uh, credit project development work, um, working with Indigenous communities and other Canadians to get and keep carbon out of the atmosphere, a lot of that through improved forest management and forest conservation type work. Um, I'm also the director or the founder and director of um, the Blockchain for Climate Foundation, and we're working to put Paris 
Agreement Article 6.2 carbon markets on the blockchain and enable a quicker and better start to that market as it gets going. So we've built a platform. Uh, it's going to be launching in, in a week or two um, live on the Ethereum blockchain for national governments to issue and exchange their Paris Agreement carbon credits as an NFT. Um, and I'm a proud member of the Bitco WG Blockchain Infrastructure Carbon Offset Working Group. And just so um, profoundly joyous and dazzled uh, to be working with this great group of really brilliant folks from across the crypto and climate space. Thanks. Um, I'm Raphael. Yes. I'm from Tucan. Hi, Gregory. Thanks. And the Tucan protocol is essentially the protocol that made BCT in broad into existence. And uh, our objective, and I'm sorry, I'm um, here in this part of Berlin, um, so I apologize if it's a little bit loud. Well, here we go. So, essentially, the Tukin Protocol, we worked very closely together with Klima to um, bring BCT into existence, the first treasury asset for the Klima DAO. And our thesis is that crypto essentially is the best tool we got to solve climate change and the coordination problem that it is. And we looked at carbon markets and realized that a lot of the market infrastructure was missing to actually create efficient markets. And um, either, either the complexity is uh, completely ignored um, or the complexity is too high and there's no liquidity. And so our approach was to create these carbon pools of which BCT is the first token. It's the token of the base carbon pool which essentially is, makes a makes an attempt at have the, having the first most liquid carbon pool on chain. And it's just really the start for many other carbon pools to come, can create more differentiated products for carbon on chain. And, uh, I'll leave it here. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Raphael. So I think maybe we can start with like the, right, just what the title of this, this Twitter spaces is about. What is a BCT and um, kind of we can work up that stack of what Raphael had briefly mentioned. Um, perhaps what would be great is to kind of see like the life, the, the life cycle of a BCT from start to finish, from where we got these, from where we had off chain to on chain to carbon credit NFTs to BCTs. But uh, maybe Raphael, if you can kind of describe what you had kind of done through uh, toucan protocol to get off-chain to on-chain. That would be great. Yeah, of course. So, essentially, our objective our objective was to um, work with the existing liquidity that we have in carbon markets, right? Because um, there, there essentially is this difficulty that we have to innovate in the whole value chain of carbon markets at the same time, right? There's a lot of problems at any at any different you know, place in value chain. And so um, when we started working with the Klima team, we knew that if we want to bootstrap enough liquidity for carbon on chain, we had to work with standards that are already established, that already have legitimacy, and that already have these credits, right? So um, the first standard that we chose to work with essentially is Vera, which is a, an NGO, and that is the biggest carbon standard so, so far. And essentially, their job is to certify carbon projects. So a carbon project is, you know, it can be anything from like a renewable energy project or a reforestation project or, you know, we're going to probably get into the details of this throughout this conversation. But essentially, a carbon project decides to engage into emission reduction or emission removal um, procedures. And the job of the carbon standard is to verify that these emission reductions have actually taken place, right? And for every one ton of carbon that is reduced or removed from the atmosphere, the standard is going to issue a, a certificate, which is also known as a carbon credit or a carbon offset certificate. And essentially, I think the best way to think of it is a positive externality that is kind of packaged into, you know, into a intangible, intangible asset, right? And the value attached to this is very much the the, the data and the signatures that, that are on it. And now, um, we essentially, with Tukan, have been, have been building a bridge. And the, 
the first source registry that we are connecting to is, is the Vero registry. And essentially, the protocol allows any holder of a carbon offset that is um, registered on the Vera, uh, Vera registry to bridge it over and to tokenize it. And now, the one thing that is really important about this process is that we keep all the attributes that are linked and that are attached to this offset certificate on chain. So um, attributes can be everything from like, which country is this from, which standard, obviously, which vintage, the vintage refers to the year, um, which methodology, we're going to dive into this probably later, the, the different methodologies to analyze how much carbon has been sequestered by a given project, and um, so on, right? There's like a list of 20 attributes that are all brought on chain alongside the certificate. And so we create what are called TCO2 tokens, which can be, you know, token carbon offsets or tokenized carbon offsets or a ton of carbon offsets, whatever you like. And um, each TCO2 token essentially is specific to a given project in here and maintains all that metadata on chain. And now, essentially, we have all these different TCO2 code tokens that are obviously not very liquid because, you know, some we only might have 100, others we might have 1,000, others we might have a million. And so that's where we come into the realm of pools. So the idea of pools is basically to allow anybody to de deposit these TCO2 tokens into a pool and mint a, a pool token. And the BCT is essentially the, B, the base carbon ton is the pool token of the base carbon pool. So you can think of the BCT as a as a token that is backed one to one by a basket of different tokenized carbon offsets from, you know, a list um, uh, of different projects and vintages. So, um, and the idea here is that in the future, when you know, now that we've proven that on-chain carbon markets are probably a thing, we can now go into more differentiated pools. We can have a nature-based carbon pool. We can have a soil carbon pool. We can have a tech-based carbon removal pool, if you wanted to, right? So, and all these pools do is that they essentially have a list of requirements. And any time you want to deposit a TCO2 token in the pool, the pool checks if this TCO2 token actually matches all the requirements and has the fitting attributes to be deposited into the pool. So um, it acts kind of as a, as a you know, filter mechanism. And so we can create different, um, different types of carbon assets and... Um, I think I'll leave it here. Maybe the last, the last thought is that so BCT essentially does represents a ton of carbon, kind of a carbon offset from a basket of different carbon offsets, and is then deposited into Sushi to have a liquid, you know, liquid like pool on chain, the trading pool, and then can also be deposited into the Klimadao Treasury as collateral through through bonding. Thanks so much, Rafa. And maybe just as a TLDR, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that what you guys have kind of um, exhibited as one of the early use cases of, of bringing this is you take carbon credits off chain, you bring them on chain as NFTs with the specific attributes, then you pull those NFTs and, uh, and carbon credit NFTs, and then you create these BCTs that represent these non-fungible um, carbon, uh, carbon ton claims that then can be used anywhere and, and everywhere, right? Mm, almost. So the NFT, so we have NFTs in our process, but essentially this is part of the, the way that carbon markets currently work is that essentially carbon offsets are, um, they, are they exist in batches, right? So um, when you have a batch of carbon offsets, essentially um, you can have like 100, you can have 1,000. And what we do is that we allow users to bring the credits over the bridge in batches, right? So you don't have to mint and every single individual carbon offset as an NFT, but you have a batch of carbon offsets that has, you know, a quantity field and kind of a quantity field of like 100, 1,000 or whatever you want, uh, or whatever it represents. And then the last process of this bridging process is that the, the batch essentially is fractionalized into individual TCO2 tokens. So... TCO2 tokens are already ERC20 tokens Got it. that are project specific and that have all that metadata, right? And then the BCT is also an ERC20 token, but essentially it's removed, it's kind of a wrapped form if you want, right? And um, 
is, is just the objective is to maximize liquidity um, for the specific asset. Got it. And maybe that's a good transition into sort of these, these pools of carbon cre- credit quality types. Is that, um, is it, is it right in saying that the TCO2s that Toucan Protocol is creating from these batched carbon credits is that with, if they exist as ERC20s natively, what is different from using the TCO2s themselves if they've been already verified as Vera credits, Vera certified credits um, to be go off and, and be used to green assets or be put into uh, a Klima treasury? Yeah, they're perfectly fine, right? And this is, so our system has been des- like designed really for maximum modularity um, because we really just want to build kind of like the foundation infrastructure and then allow others to build on top of it, right? And the role of TCO2s in our system is very simple, is that some, you know, the, the, the provenance and the data that is backing a carbon offset is still very relevant to most people who use them, right? And this is probably why we're having this conversation in the first place. So, um, and you can, when you, because, you know, carbon offsets, they have a word in the, word, in, in the name, which is offset. And the, the offsetting part of this whole cycle is probably also important to think about. So the offsetting is when somebody wants to make a claim about, you know, being carbon neutral, for instance. And that claim happens when um, a carbon token is burnt. And essentially what needs to be burned is a TCO2 token. So when a TCO2 token has been burned, then you can make a claim that you have offset one ton of carbon from this specific project in this specific region and from this specific year, right? So this is the role of the TCO2 tokens. And there's absolutely no need for putting them into VCT if you don't want to, right? And we very much plan on having other applications that don't actually you know, interact with the VCT pool at all, where you know, project developers or you know, retailers can list their TCO2 tokens, so essentially they're their credits from different projects directly um, via like a direct sales marketplace or whatever you want, right? Or even allow, you know, um, games or metaverse projects or whatever to to use a specific token from a specific project because they like that specific project when it's in a region that that they like. So this this the use of the TCO2 is essentially to maintain and the granularity of and like the complexity of carbon market and to like reflect it on chain to not lose that and give, you know, the builders out there the possibility to choose whichever asset they want to interact with, right? And so it's important to say, to know that the BCT can always be burnt to redeem an underlying TCO2 token. So holding BCT for like, let's say two years, um, essentially, you know, after two years, you can still select which, you know, TCO2 token you want to essentially redeem out of this basket and if you want to offset you can still make a claim that you have offset with this specific project so i hope this kind of clears it up what the role of the bct and the tc2 token or like the relation between yeah that was very helpful and i'd like to get gregory joseph and sarah's input on on some of these quality types as well because right I think what a lot of people may uh, as casual observers or of, of what had been going on in Klima were kind of misinterpreting what a BCT was. But then as you kind of explain the stack, there are quite a few stacks in here from the carbon credits off chain, carbon credits being batched, create these TCO2s, and then you have BCTs, and then you have Klima on top of that, that also exists as sort of a redemption to the underlying Klima DAO vault. But uh, what what is interesting is, and what we've seen is that right, especially on these sushi swap pools that are specifically on Polygon at the moment for the Klima DAO um, ecosystem, is that right? We have BCTs trading at let's say I think it's around five dollars now, um, but then we also understand that right, as you had mentioned, like these these TCO twos or these carbon credits that have now been tokenized, they also come from a variety of sources. Uh, I think some examples being. Right, you have like these forestry carbon credits that usually trade at a premium around ten dollars or, or so, like a, a, a carbon credit from like the Zimbabwe National Forest, and then you have carbon credits that also come from from these like Chinese hydro or or Chinese natural gas that are that that trade for let's say four dollars or, or five dollars a, a ton, which is almost half of what um, what has been been what, what forestry carbon credits trade for. 
But then also uh, interesting in context is that, right, as Klima had mentioned, that they would be only um, accepting carbon credits that had been verified uh, or, or, or under the umbrella of VERA certification is that they all, all come in as these batches priced very differently, but then now have a single price ticker ultimately as when they, be, when they become BCTs. And so I think from there, um, we get a lot of interesting conversation question on how specific we can kind of see the, the carbon credits, um, carbon credit markets on chain um, evolve and, 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 and flourish and what that actually means for as what you mentioned, what people will prefer, right? So uh, maybe Sarah could um, maybe speak a little bit to, the, to, to that. Uh, so. Yeah, thanks for that intro, Daniel. Um, so somebody really amazing put together some code that allowed me to export every credit information set that was ever uh, retired on Vera. So I was able to narrow it down to the ones that just have sort of the toucan information in them and do some analytics in the last couple of days. Um, and we're probably, as the working group, going to release the data set and let the public have it. You know, it's a, a snapshot at a point in time and um, we've been told there's some potential analytics coming out as well. Um, but there's a lot of different project types that are in here. So the BCT price really, to a large extent, reflects this blended market average. And what was really interesting about this is, you know, we have 398 um, instances of crossing the bridge in, in this data set. But about 300 of those are energy industries, so renewable and non-energy or non-renewable sources. Um, and the next largest category is agriculture, forestry, and other land use, so the nature-based credits. So a large number of these credits are traditionally some that have lower prices to them, um, which when you think about the blended average by scale of just the volume of BCTs that exist currently, um, that's a lot of different um, credit types. And so I think what people are trying to generally unpack at this stage is, you know, what's in a BCT? You know, how many of each of these different types of credits went in? There are some people whose credits that, you know, became a TCO2 were a dollar credit. Some people's credits were $10 credits. And there's this blended microeconomic approach happening right now with all the buy and sell that, if you can't see, you know, everything that's underlying it, it's hard to understand why the price is that way. And there were some other interesting trends in this data set. You know, there was a lot of different, you know, energy projects in here. But when you look at a lot of the methodologies themselves that were attached to these credits, a good chunk of those methodologies were previously retired, which means credits aren't produced off of that specific version anymore. So there's a lot of credits underlying the BCT that the methods were retired in 2018 and 2020. And when you look at, you know, the volume that went across the bridge, you know, the largest volume uh, was 300,000 credits as one bridge instance. The average volume was about 24,500. And the smallest volume was, frankly, just a test for you know, one credit that crossed the bridge. So there's a lot of different underlying data points here that start to beg the question of, you know, what might it look like if some of these TCO2s were bundled in a slightly different way? And I think a, a good use case is the, you know, the forestry credits, the agriculture and nature credits. The marketplace over the counter prices them significantly higher than a BCT. And right now, the price of the BCT, for example, is disincentivizing for the development of those types of projects and disincentivizing towards people who hold forestry credits to bring them over these bridges and turn them into BCTs because the blend in price average is less than what it actually costs to buy them in the marketplace right now. So at least at Regen, we're, we're nature people. We believe that the climate solution that we want to see developed in the world is really the restoration of ecosystems and natural capital. And so it is just a really interesting point in time to reflect and have this community debate of, you know, are carbon credits the same? You know, what carbon credits 
have more value, is there the opportunity to bring in carbon credit projects that are, for example, nature-based and, you know, have an alternate to something like a BCT that's more reflective of natural capital and could be its own unique asset inside the ecosystem? So I'll probably pause there and see if, in particular, Joseph has any responses or Gregory, because um, I know this is a topic that we've debated about a lot in the working group itself. Hi. Um, so this is Joseph. Um, I would say um, uh, on the topic of, of offset quality and just to like uh, take it back a little bit. So I've been developing carbon offset projects essentially nonstop since 2004 um, and in blockchain since 2017. And the launch of the the tokenization of BCTs by Toucan and the launch of Klimadao really is a quantum leap forward in, in my opinion, um, because it's, you know, hand in, in glove created um, the tokenized carbon feedstock um, and a super powerful DeFi use case um, to soak up that feedstock and, and purchase offsets off the market. And um, this is an amazing thing. Um, and um, the, that traceability that um, the blockchain allows, but Toucan really leveraged in this system is really impressive. And so it's that traceability that allows us to build out this dashboard of all of the projects, all of the tons, all of the methodologies um, that have been used uh, to create BCTs. Um, and one of the things that I'll, I'll say just to the, the token dynamics, and you know, I know it to a certain level, um, but I know what is really important for Klimadao um, is to be able to have a supply of BCTs um, to feed into their system. Um, and so it's this fascinating amalgam of a token really that Klima, Klimadao creates, plus a BCT that are bonded together and make a Klima token um, that is sort of their marketplace token. Um, and in order to do that, um, they needed to have liquidity in, in BCTs. They needed to have enough BCT tokens around to be able to bond to all the Klima tokens um, in that one-to-one -one aspect. And then they have other mechanisms native to the DAO that they've built that also soak up BCTs. So I think there's now about four BCTs, so four tons of retired Vera carbon credits backing each Klima DAO token. Um, and so I know that, that this, as a launch tool and dynamic um, required one pool um, of credits. Um, and as has been discussed, it, it, it roped in a range of credits from ones that often sell for a lot less expensive and were surely, um, you know, acquired at a lower price, um, bundled in with, um, with tons that were more expensive. Um, and uh, I, I like I think this is great, and, and having that bundling aspect is amazing, and then also the ability to pull it to, to disaggregate it and see what's in there. Um, I think for me, like as a long term partic uh, uh, practitioner in the carbon market, um, I see the dynamic being created slightly different than the um, the dominant one that I see on Twitter and and in DeFi. And, and crypto Twitter land, you know, that being that we're a black hole and we're soaking up carbon credits a, so other people can't use them um, uh, or, or other things. And, you know, how I see this purchase of carbon offsets um, is basically, you know, the people um, buying into Klima and using this system are purchasing real proven emission reduction outcomes um, that have gone through, you know, a top flight, very stringent um, off-chain offset development process um, and then been brought on chain. And it's a little weird because somebody might think, well, oh, those offsets were already made. So why does buying them and retire them help save the planet? Um, and it's kind of the same reason, you know, that if you want a head of lettuce, um, when you go buy it at the grocery store, you're not actually causing that head of lettuce to be grown at that moment you buy it. Um, but it's part of a supply chain that has a reasonable expectation that if they grow the lettuce, then you will buy it later at the grocery store. And so that dynamic I find is really helpful for thinking about how does all this strange, you know, crypto machination um, tie back down to helping beat climate change and save the planet. Um, and so what I see with this massive 
um, basically market buy of offsets is now all of these offsets um, are are going for more on the market. And what that does is that tells project developers um, that they have an opportunity to go to go do new projects um, or to extend old ones and, and do more um, more planting, more protection, more switching of um, dirty processes to clean. Um, and so kind of as a project developer, you know, born as a project developer and my mind often really sits there, it's so exciting because, um, you know, I know Regen Network, um, my team, lots of people work with real projects on the ground and this uptick in market demand that is sort of coming along with other sources of demand in the carbon market means that we can move ahead with projects. Like I'm actually able to do that with ones that have been on on hold for a bit because, you know, we have a reasonable chance to be able to create a credit um, that sells for the money needed to actually make that project go. And so that's sort of that, um, that aspect of the flywheel of, of the crypto economics driving real stuff on the ground. And I'm so excited to see more of that. And I'm so excited to see, you know, discussions starting around, hey, can we spin up, uh, you know, a way to go and fund real projects um, that is even, you know, less disaggregated from, you know, DAO treasuries or or the specific thing, you know, can DAOs support people going and, and spooling up great projects and so on and so forth. Um, so that's all exciting. And, you know, to me, um, I, I consider myself kind of on the more, um, what's the word, <laughs> gnarly grumpy end of, of carbon credit quality, all things concerned, um, uh, being very picky about it from being a practitioner in the space. Um, but what I really can say is um, I think that the selection of verified carbon standard um, as, you know, the initial standard that can feed tons into the system was a great pick. It's got you know, I think 70% of the issued tons, um, you're able to, to, you know, to engage at a certain level with its registry system. Um, and, you know, that we have these projects um, that are all, you know, they have a floor quality reflected by, you know, the need to be successfully created and issued as a verified um, carbon unit by Vera. And so I think that's a big deal. And so where we do all have our own preferences um, for activity type and the things that go into this, um, what the verified carbon standard really is saying is that this project and this ton that's being created is the product of a real project that really happened, that got or kept carbon out of the atmosphere, um, that was beyond business as usual, also known as additional in, in the industry. Um, and, and so I think that's profound and it's a really good leveraging of what's available um, on the blockchain and you know toucan doing an incredible job of of linking that on-chain to off-chain on off-chain to on-chain um and then linking into a great off-chain system that is provably doing good stuff in the environment and um i know a lot of people are excited about sort of moving that hand off to the left and being able to do more um um using of chain to enable projects, which I think is all very exciting. But I think, you know, right now and and all the way through using the tools that we have and the, the great rigor that's been built up over decades in the carbon space and bridging it onto blockchain through here um, is quite a delight to see. Very inspiring and, and really proud of everybody involved. Thanks. Nice. I'm going to be even more of a curmudgeon because Joseph, you're, you're not actually a curmudgeon. You're so nice. <laughs> So I want to I want to bring up um, one point which I actually just saw raised also in the carbon uh, market in the climate out discord which is awesome just I, I think it's it, one important conversation there's like this tension or dynamic between liquidity and market efficiency and quality of the asset that backs Klima's treasury and I think you know, clearly what um, Raphael is talking about and the Toucan team has in its roadmap to, to create more uh, distinction and segmentation in the market, um, I believe that's, that's the right direction. Like we need to have um, other projects besides the base carbon ton accepted by Klimadao. Why? Because... Like to just sort of speak frankly, because what's happening is people buying the worst credits 
with the most questionable additionality that are considered to be the cheapest in the marketplace are making the most money. And people buying the best credits that have the most rigor and the most positive impact are losing money. And that's all getting put into the clima treasury. And I think it potentially, the risk there is that there's a legitimacy crisis around the value that's backing the clima token and that that actually slows down this beautifully designed flywheel bringing together sort of the, the DeFi instruments and tools we have. And so I think, you know, so I think there's a really interesting conversation to have about market efficiency, liquidity, and having segmentation so that there's quality control and how to nail that right to really have the highest quality assets back in Klima possible. So those are just a, that's just a, a, a few thoughts. I'll keep it sort of short and spicy, and and see what people yeah say that. that was that was really interesting. And I was actually um, explaining or, or 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 thinking about this. I I kind of was drawing a bunch of stuff on a whiteboard uh, last night and kind of imagining a bit of what uh, uh, Rafa had had described in terms of like the roadmap that you that you just mentioned, Gregory for the segmentation and the modularity and the very specific, the specificity that we can get in terms of the type of carbon credit projects, as, as we had kind of described where there's forestry carbon credits that may be like $10 a ton. And then there's like renewable energy credits, like carbon Chinese hydro that might be like four or $3 a ton. Um, and, and I, and I think, right. There's maybe two, two schools of thought, of how people are approaching um, sort of this whole good behavior is incentivized concept. I think it, uh, on the whole, the the good behavior that we've defined here as purchasing carbon credits has been sufficiently incentivized with what ClimaDAO has been able to remarkably do in terms of like um, getting so much liquidity, you know, shooting up to a billion dollars in market cap within a couple of days, and then really putting it um, this whole climate tech scene this crypto climate tech scene on everyone's radar, right? With people like, you know, Mark Cuban even like being part and excited about this, this sort of sort of work. But there's the the two schools of thought is I, I would say perhaps um, the I like the ideology and also the profit maximalism that 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 you're you're talking about. Where if let's say people were given a choice uh uh, agnostic of, of of price, and then they were saying, "Hey, would you want to buy these carbon credits from uh, like the Zimbabwe National Forest that helps those projects there, or would you want to have like Chinese hydro?" Then I think most people would prefer to kind of choose what they usually associate with carbon credits and CO two sequestration, right? With with trees and forestry projects, but when then, but when you have this sort of Right, the D the D gens of DeFi becoming regens by doing carbon credit purchasing. You also give them that option of yes, we we there's this this carbon credit that is half the price of what I can get for this other carbon credit. And then when push comes to shove, when there is this whole profit maximalism uh, concept that we are that a lot of us I think trying to work on these uh, these projects are kind of leaning into to to get some of this done. Is that it is it is ultimately gonna kind of flow into the way of cheaper carbon credits. I don't personally agree with that, and I think that there's maybe right if if push comes to shove, like I I had chosen to um, purchase more expensive carbon credits because they were specifically forestry uh, re- related. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's um, people want to maximize their profits. Um, and because we've kind of opened these these uh, floodgates, right under the let's say a bit broader um, umbrella of of what type of carbon credits can be accepted, I think I think that's what we eventually have, um, right? And I'm I'm just kind of be a bit um, play devil's advocate there, but right, those two pathways exist: the ideological pathway and the profit maximalism pathway. And I think most DGENs do choose the the profit maximalism pathway, um, but but yeah, yeah. Uh, Ras XT, if you have any comments on like the like the like those two different pathways, right? Like carbon credit, um, yeah, carbon credit types. 
uh, ideology or profit maxi, I guess. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's primarily what I was keen to talk about, which is looking at carbon as an investment. I think um, I think we can probably all safely assume that everybody in this room is is quite passionate about sustainability. Is quite passionate about uh, carbon offsetting and getting the funding to the projects mm-hmm. that are doing you know really important work. Um, however, I think it's also quite exciting in this crypto space to be talking about carbon as an investment. You know, all of all of the data and reports and analytics, uh, you know, and, and analysis we're seeing, um, you know, probably uh, the most prominent one people will, will know of is the, is the, um, um, is the, uh, what's what we call it? Brain fart there. Um, what, what, you know, one of the big reports talking about carbon credits and the price expecting to, to 20x and 100x in 30 years. 100x in 30 years, uh, 10x in the next five to 10 years. You know, and this is looking at the increasing demand from the governments buying up the baseline carbon credits. And the UK, we're seeing this quite quite actively with the forest credits. The UK government has a, a large grant scheme in place, essentially snapping up all of the forest credits. And we're also seeing a lot of startups coming in, um, moving into their scale-up phase. In the UK, for example, we've got quite a few energy startups that have deeply entrenched themselves now and taking customers away from the existing uh, suppliers of energy and primarily all they're doing is being green they're buying carbon offsets they're offsetting the energy you use in your home and they're providing you with green energy right but we're going to continue to see this we obviously one of the other ones people talk about is microsoft microsoft is now going carbon neutral we're seeing lots and lots more of these net zero promises right? and, and all of this is indicating that companies are turning around uh, coming around to that consumer pressure Right, they're responding to the consumer pressure. These startups are coming in and highlighting the pressure. Fantastic if, if all the startups can, can continue to excel and all the more power to them. But the big boys and the big girls, big ladies and big women are going to be turning around and making changes and buying more carbon credits. So we're going to see this increase in demand, right? Now for us, if we're buying carbon credits, that's an exciting moment. If we're looking at a market that's going to 10x and then 100x in 50 years, that's an exciting opportunity for investment. Now, if we go back to the beginning, we're saying, yes, we're all, we all care about the environment. How can we leverage investment potential, which is a lot of what the crypto guys in this crypto space are looking for, to make some realistic, powerful impact to, to the climate today? Because... 100x of the price is talking about the demand increasing in 10 years. You know, sorry, 100x is in 50 years, right? The 10x is in 20 years. 20 years is too is too long. It's, it's not it's not quick enough. We need to be starting to act now. This is what excites me most about this crypto but crypto carbon space. We can leverage the you know the the liquidity and investment that we currently have in crypto. Get money into carbon credits into the projects fund the projects that we need to be acting now to start sequestering, removing, you know, whether you're a, a remover or a, a preventer um, in terms of carbon, everyone has their preference. Um, but start getting that funding to them now and leverage the people that want to be making money on that. So we don't need to necessarily be upset with people looking to make money. Sustainability doesn't necessarily being need to be the, you know, the a minority of people doing it perfectly but if we can get the majority of people doing it imperfectly it's far more effective so i think talking on that what i'm interested in understanding from you guys is your perspective on carbon price i've heard it talk about it a lot everyone's like forest is 10 10 dollars um chinese uh, hydroelectric four dollars but we're talking about price as if it's a two-way right and so currently what we're saying when we say price is you can buy those carbon credits for ten dollars you can buy those for four. And my question is, can you sell it for 10? Once you've retired it and we brought it on chain and we're now looking at it, could you sell to, say, Uniswap once they want uh, to start offsetting? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably that. Except a, a retired, a token that represents a retired uh, carbon. But would you be able to sell it to prime carbon broker in the market in the UK today? Probably not. Maybe in 50 years you could. Maybe five years you might be able to. They might have just moved from Excel spreadsheet to a more complex you know, CRM. And, and I think that's the point I kind of want to talk about is understanding the impact of having little arbitrage between the off-market prices and the on-market prices. I can by say having that the- um, there's already people wanting to come and buy um, BCT's 
for their own um, for their own carbon offsetting. Um, so folks have been reaching out about that. I see in the space. Um, so yeah, people definitely do um, buy uh, buy those, and people are excited because it's you know one of the it's uh, an extant and current example of bringing carbon on chain. There are definitely other pathways people are doing it um, and have done it all the way back to 2017 um, with Dow IPCI. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. And I, I know that um, I'd love to hand it over to, to Raphael because um, I know Toucan is doing a lot of innovation and, you know, they've been working hard delivering this one specific implementation of their tool very well so that Klima can, um, Klima Dow can blossom. Um, but I know they've got a lot of other stuff that they are, that are developing, including along that line. Uh, so over to Raphael. Cheers. Yeah. I mean, I think there's been a couple of points here that are really interesting. And I, I, I think I'll start with, you know, at the beginning about idealism versus like market efficiency or more like maximizing profits. And, and, you know, Gregory and I have had conversations for like probably 18 months now, and he, he knows very well that um, I'm very much an idealist. And this has been very difficult for me personally um, these last 18 months because um, we kind of have a chicken and egg problem in that we have to create liquidity to make something like Klimadao and just turn, you know, carbon as a collateral. This is really what it's about, right? Like carbon offsets today are used as like positive externalities and their only use case is to match them with negative externalities, right? When you have polluting companies that want to make some claim about being carbon neutral. But honestly, like this is, this is one of the most boring use cases in my opinion. And the most like, this is one of the most saddest uses that we can have for positive externalities in the world, right? Like we want to find new ways to incentivize positive externalities and positive behavior, right? And this is what really, you know, this is what token economics allow us to do. And this is why it's super exciting to be in crypto and climate at this time in, you know, in the universe, because we now finally have the tools, the coordination mechanisms to design incentives for people to use these positive externalities in other ways than just matching them with negative ones, right? And like Klimada really is just the first instance of this. And it's just like, you know, based on the Olympus mechanics, one of the most, you know, one of the smartest ways of incentivizing this. And uh, I can tell you from like working really closely with them is that the whole idea, you know, is to kickstart this market and it's to absorb this like low quality stuff. And what's really important to understand there, and like Sarah said it already at the beginning, is that a lot of these like methodologies even that are backing these credits are, are retired, meaning that they're, you know, these type of credits can could no longer be created in that form, right? So um, I don't know if who here reads Carbon Pulse, but just like probably the most read like kind of newsletter in carbon markets. And, and they've reported that they've seen massive, you know, uh, that there's already a pretty impressive price uh, increase in like carbon markets because of climate now, right? So we can already see uh, an effect of somewhat of a like one dollar increase in prices over the last like two weeks. So if we keep you know if we keep doing this, we're pretty rapidly gonna come into a you know situation where where the low quality stuff has been absorbed. And I would very much agree with Gregory that it's in very important also for the long term um, stability of climate to start accumulating higher quality stuff. And I can tell everybody that we're already working on this with like, you know, partners and some of them here on stage to um, to have a high quality uh, carbon ton that can also be integrated into Klima, right? So um, this is this is absolutely necessary. And I think, you know, it's just important to remember, like we're all, you know, we're all working into the, like we're all working to achieving the same goals here. and. Uh, I do think that um, incentivizing the highest quality, and, and this is really like, you know, please don't go out and like retire BCT and claim that you just, you know, that you're carbon neutral. Like, honestly, this is not what it's been designed for. And uh, I see, you know, I, I I see better use cases for that. Like this is, you know, the claims that can be attached to this is, is, is a whole, whole different conversation. But it has been designed in this way to bootstrap a market on chain. And now, 
like now we have we can you know now we can start building now we can start really integrating carbon into other DeFi protocols and really increase the utility of carbon on chain and the sheer adoption as carbon of collateral can create this this powerful um, pull and this this very powerful signal to project developers uh, to start you know engaging in new projects and um, hopefully also of higher quality. Thanks so much, Rafa. And and I and I think right. Even, I think maybe Gregory had coined the term like degens becoming regens, but he actually made uh, a kind kind of maybe Gregory. You can kind of touch on what you kind of think some of the cores of the act the, the conversation from your perspective is. Right, you had mentioned something about like market segmentation uh, with the yeah. premium, this type of quality, and the impacts with liquidity and market efficiency. Right. I think the, the 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 prime tension to navigate has to do with <clears throat> generating enough liquidity for market efficiency. And I think one side of the you know in quotes argument, I, although I think this is more of a dialogue really that's taking place, or like we're figuring out what makes sense here. On one side, sort of like oh, we need liquidity and efficient markets in order to sort of bootstrap this whole mechanism. On the other hand you know, we need legitimacy and we need real impact to be at the core of the value that's being um, brought into the Klima treasury or, you know, or, or whatever the mechanism is that's taking place. And, and to reconcile those two is going to be a little bit of a back and forth over time. And so the launch, you know, we see the, the, the launch uh, dynamics incentivized sort of like sweeping the floor and pulling in the lowest quality and rewarded people who were capable of doing that. And now I think the next iteration, as, as Rob is saying, is sort of like, how does, how do incentives, like how does the money flow to the people who are trying to raise the bar? And you may see this oscillate back and forth a few times, is my guess, where there's going to be sort of dynamics that oscillate back and forth. Um, you know, again, I would just sort of center my observations as a Klima fan and, you know, disclaimer as a, as an investor, like a Klima holder and um, as a BCT provider um, and as a founder of a, of a complementing um, protocol in the ecosystem, my perspective is really the hot, the, the highest leverage sort of like question to be asking is what gen like what generates the most, value for the Klima treasury? What's the strategy that generates the most value for the Klima treasury? And I think that's likely to sort of evolve over time, right? And I personally, both ideologically and from a market perspective, think that the transition from degen to regen means that we need to be valuing the highest quality um, credits that have the most positive impact on the planet and that that's really what we need to keep our sights on. And personally, I actually think the like sweep the floor move may be a little bit of a distraction and like doesn't actually generate the outcome that we're wanting, but I can also see the counterpoint there, but I don't sort of, I don't buy it. I actually think it, it can kind of like undermine the value, the perception of value of like what is Klima and why is it backed by something important. I actually think it's diminished by the sweep, the floor sweeping. Thanks so much, Gregory. And um, and I, and I think a point there is right the the power of these sort of these decentralized systems is that Klima can definitely be like you know operated through these governance proposals to request more specifics on the type of uh, carbon credit types that they do accept into their treasury, as kind of Rafa had. Rafa had been um, uh, mentioning, right? When we get very specific carbon credit types and education understanding around what type, what carbon credits and from what projects they can go into, then we can get that sort of um, we can approach the ideal of 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 what we what we seek out to accomplish. Um, yeah, yeah. I can I can just like, just to add to this point. Right. I Fully agree. I see like Klima will have a very diverse basket of different um, different assets, you know, in the future. And I agree with Gregory that like um, it is important to start thinking about like what comes next. And it's I can all I can assure you this is already happening. 
And um, um, so, yeah, uh, and just because I see Raj XT, you have your hand up, and I just want, I, for, I realized that I didn't um, answer your previous question, so I'll just do this right now about the, um, the tokens essentially on chain and kind of the demand for these tokens. And I can just, I can, you know, just agree with what Joseph has been saying is that like, we see a lot of demand already for this. Also, interestingly, coming from the off-chain world, and I think this has very much, you know, this has to do with the same level of transparency um, that you know allows us to have this conversation. Is that having an on-chain registry that has all the data down to like, you know, each project and year uh, is actually a, a pretty, you know, it's a pretty powerful tool and a pretty powerful signal. Uh, for traditional companies as well, right? Because a lot of companies and real world are also um, criticized for uh, the lack of transparency that they have and that they provide about like what credits they actually use to um, to offset their emissions. And by choosing a, a tokenized product, essentially, it is now very, very clear and like transparent and, you know, forever, it's forever there that this, you know, this credit has been used for, by this company to offset and you know all the data is on chain as well. So uh, I think in this this context, it's just really important to remember what what a carbon offset really is, right? It, it's really just a it's a very intent. It's like you know a, a constructed product that exists because of some um, data that has been collected about a project, and then a couple of signatures that have been put on that data that turn it into like you know a batch of like let's say a thousand carbon offsets and um, Moving this, you know, moving this over uh, from a, and this is the job of the carbon standards, right? But but the carbon standards also do today is that they maintain these registries, and um, essentially these registries are, you know, very, very Web one type registries, I'll call them, and um, I think that public blockchains are just like by default a better type of registry to be used to keep track of like environmental state data and these, you know, these, these assets. And um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Razex, because I know you have a different view on this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't think I, I, I fundamentally uh, oppose your, your point of view. I think I'm, I'm more of a question mark. You know, I think my, my core goal, although being a sustainable, you know, pa passionate sustainability advocate, um, is to is to make this as profitable as possible for people, because as soon as it's profit, the crypto will move in, right? And I think that you know, speaking to you, to what I was saying before, I want to get as much money into the carbon carbon crypto space as possible. Um, so I kind of want to talk about that value side of things, potentially using the word you used before, which is idealism. You know, and and by by no means, I mean I'm sure there's lots of people who are. Who are, who are comfortable in, and who get it, right? Who get that being on the blockchain, you know, the carbon market on, on blockchain uh, as a registry is far superior. I think everybody in this room gets that as well. Um, my experience um, working for two sustainability-focused startups uh, is that most people are not quite sure. And, and I'm talking about sustainability professionals within... Uh, Retail-focused companies, for example, uh, even the sustainability-focused uh, individuals or professions, <laughs> they're still looking for that Vera stamp. They're still looking for um, for for that. Um, they still have it for that stamp of ability. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it makes sense if you can get those retails to adopt directly the project. Um, so using Tucan, right? For example, um, if they are directly in, uh, interacting with you. However, the current setup is that everybody has their own broker, whether they're using an API broker, whether they're using Bob, who's their uncle's cousin, um, you know, and has an agency, and somebody else is doing the majority of the work. Most companies don't have a large sustainability department. They've got um, somebody with five years experience um, and who writes the reports uh, and gets the funding um, and, and speaks to the agency and gets the credits. Now, I think from an idealistic perspective, fantastic, let's change how everyone's doing everything because it is better to do it this way. I 100% agree with you. But I'm looking on the more pragmatic side and saying, how can we make a change in the next two to four years? And I think that we're all in this sort of crypto space, which is highly innovative, exciting and fast paced. But Bob in accounting is not. 
And the majority of companies across the UK and the US are going to be a lot slower. And they're still going to use those brokers. They're still going to use those intermediaries. So we have to can, also consider looking at I can at tell you that we have brokers, brokers that are like, a, like approaching us to move their stuff like over to Toucan. So uh, I think that what we're going to see is that these brokers, and it's very simple, right? Because these brokers, they are driven by profits. Right, and you know that very well. And they're taking pretty, pretty juicy margins also. So uh, the brokers yeah. will be the first one to jump on this, and for the simple reason then that they are sitting on a lot of these credits. And today, a carbon offset is a very unproductive, unproductive asset which just sits in the bank, or not even in the bank. It just sits on a Excel sheet, right? And yeah. having the possibility as a broker to move your stuff over and to earn even like let's say three or four percent on your asset in Aave, trust me, they're, they're getting this already. And this is the most simple, like, you know, it's a, the simplest use case. It's just like turning carbon into an asset that is connected to DeFi ha, is so powerful that we have very, very much Bob type people, however, whatever, I, I, all the Bobs, I apologize if we use you for, but we have very, very traditional people that are approaching us. Um, that understand that this is an opportunity for them to earn passive income on their assets while they sit in unproductively on their balance sheets today. And and just to make it clear, like our goal is to connect these projects directly to Toucan and directly to 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 the kind of market infrastructure that is connected to it. It's just like you know, like you have to start somehow. And the beauty of brokers is that they have. Um, they, they, they have a lot of users and a lot of customers already. Yeah. But the end goal here is, hey, you have a project um, in whatever, in, in Colombia, and they don't have to actually sell to the broker in the first place because we made it so easy for them to manage their inventory on chain using a, some protocol like Toucan that has all the superpowers that DeFi, you know, uh, is, equips you with. Um you know, like my, my thesis when I got into this space, and I've done a lot of work actually on the supply side first and talking to projects, trying to convince them to come over to DeFi, and nobody cared. Like, like nobody cared because there was no clear demand signal. Now that there is a demand signal, mm. people are coming and people are excited, right? So um, it, we needed this big bang. We needed, we, we needed this to make, you know, to make people aware that this is happening and to make people understand that there's an opportunity, and I can tell you, people get it. And some people won't, I agree. So some people, it's going to take five years, but I think I think you'd be surprised how quickly this can go. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be an interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I agree that one of the things that I see happening is the rapid adoption of people who, who we wouldn't necessarily have immediately thought were going to sort of like jump in and get crypto pilled. This is a, such a fantastic place. And I think generally speaking, centering sort of the, the DeFi world and DeFi instruments in the climate finance space is just really a fantastic um, opportunity for the crypto space. I, I wanted to just sort of bring up some of the, um, some of the pieces that are being worked on in the larger space by, you know, what, what's really interesting that I like, that I like and I see going on is Klima, Toucan, Region, um, F2 Pool, uh, Rin, BTC, Seasons. There's a lot of people out there who are working on building sort of this open infrastructure for the type of um, sort of money building blocks that we need for this sort of fully verifiable, fully on-chain um, regist claims registries, asset registries, and then sort of to be able to plug that into the DeFi infrastructure. It's very exciting. I think one of the things that we've been working on a long time at Regen is just sort of creating an eco-credit module that allows for um, this sort of minting of uh, unique assets, and I think it's, it's, it's very similar in a lot of ways to the approach that Toucan has, has gone, and then we see convergent evolution with the focus, folks at Seasons, and I think we're going to start to see, I hope we're going to start to see 
uh, sort of a Cambrian explosion of different attempts to get this right mix between something that's highly liquid and has market efficiency and something that is sort of specific and auditable enough so that you can um, kind of like drive premium value and price signals around things like the, the full ecological impact or the auditability and rigor behind a claim. And I think, you know, that's what's, that, that's what's really exciting. And I, and I don't think we're quite there yet. It's like we're teetering on the precipice of that world, just about we're about to see it. And I think the Klima launch certainly was kind of a, a huge fuel for, for all of that. Um, it's, uh, it's about 10 minutes past the hour.